and uh, welcome to the 7th of February 2022 meeting of Cabinet. Um, it's a first for Cabinet to um, uh, deal with uh, two remote uh, members of the, um, <coughs> this evening, um, Councillor Vinehall uh, overseas in Australia and the officer Chris Watchman who I believe is uh, more local than um, Australia. Um, our revenues and benefits manager will both be joining the uh, meeting remotely. Uh, please leave your cameras on and mute your microphone when not speaking, as this will reduce feedback and background noise and save bandwidth to prevent loss of connection. After each item has been presented, I will invite members to present in the room to ask questions first. Councillor Vinehall will then be invited to speak, and he should indicate his wish to do so by using the raise your hand facility. Only those members of Cabinet present in the room will be making the decisions. I will confirm the result verbally for the benefit of those watching webcast. Please be aware that there can be a time delay of around five seconds whilst a remote participant appears on the screen. When the meeting goes into confidential session, exclusion of press and public <coughs> exempt information by virtue of part one of schedule 12A of the Local Government Act 1972, the webcast will be temporarily suspended and the confidential item has been discussed. Once discussed, the live stream will be resumed. Okay, if we can uh, move into the meeting and uh, welcome to those that may be tuning in um, on um, uh, the, uh, what? YouTube. Okay, if we can uh, agenda item to resolve the minutes of the last meeting, be confirmed as a correct record of the proceedings and uh, will be signed by me. Do you all agree? Agreed. Thank you, Arthur. Okay. Item two, are there any apologies for absence? Julie? No, there's no apologies for absence. Okay. Are there any additional items, Malcolm? Yeah, no additional items, Gareth. Are there any urgent decision items, Malcolm? There are no urgent decisions this evening, Gareth. Thank you. Um, disclosure of interests, um, I believe members are aware as the need to speak clarity if you have a personal, personal and prejudicial and say the agenda item it refers to. Members with a personal and prejudicial interest will be asked to, to leave temporarily from the meeting at the start of the item. Members will be invited to rejoin the meeting when the item is finished. Okay, so if we can move into the first um, agenda item, which is agenda item six. Let's get it up on my screen. <coughs> And that's the draft revenue budget um, recommendations to council that consequent to the deliberations of overview and scrutiny committee. Um, and I'll, I'll ask Chief Finance Officer Tony Baden to present this report, please, Tony. Thank you very much, Chair, and good evening, everyone. Uh, so, yes, as I say, the uh, Cabinet are asked to uh, recommend the report, uh, or recommend to council the, the draft revenue budget, as you see in front of you and the council tax and the special expenses set out in Appendix C as well. Uh, so the report is uh, essentially it's the third phase of the budget process that uh, I've explained to, to members since uh, we first started it back in November, December, when we took the first phase of it, the medium-term financial plan. Uh, and the second phase was a more detailed report, members will recall, that went to uh, Cabinet uh, on the 10th of January and then was considered by the and Scrutiny Committee after that. Uh, not an awful lot has changed in the actual numbers itself, Chair. Uh, the, the, the report covers off a, a few minor changes and outlines of special expenses in more detail than has been reported uh, before uh, and details the outcome of the, uh, of the budget consultation. I'll go on to say a little bit more about that later. So uh, the headlines are appendices A and B. They're virtually the same as was reported to uh, ca uh, Cabinet back in January, um, uh, which was, as I say, part to uh, phase two of the process. There are some minor changes in paragraphs five to eight. I've outlined those for members. Uh, and it's basically it's resulted in a slightly lower than originally planned with uh, drawdown from reserves of about £188,000. So very, very small changes in the grand scheme of things. Uh, and Appendix D, as you'd expect, that shows a knock-on impact on reserves. So it's only changed marginally from what was previously reported. So... Uh, 
the main developments, as I say, are the comments from overview and scrutiny, which, uh, which you'll probably want to take into account, and uh, also some just a few observations on the uh, on the budget consultation feedback. Um, the deadline for consultation was the 31st of January, uh, and we received 275 responses, uh, mainly from residents. Uh, and the demographics and the geographical makeup of those responses are, are detailed in the uh, in, in paragraphs two and three. Uh, there are six questions in total, uh, which we uh, discussed and agreed with the um, portfolio holder for, uh, for, uh, for finance and performance before, um, before we sent them out. They're quite wide ranging. Um, I won't go through every single response uh, and every single item, Chair, because it'll be, uh, it's quite a lengthy read. But uh, just to pull out a few highlights for members that you might find of interest. Um, and the one that interested me anyway was 66% uh, of the um, respondents felt informed about the financial challenges facing councils, um, which I was quite encouraged by, actually, as an accountant. It's, uh, um, many of the respondents or the responses across to the questions actually reflect what the council is trying to do or is already included in its budget plan. So there's a, a sort of a, an affirmation, if you like, of what we're trying to achieve. Uh, for example, charges for, um, for certain services that are, you know, may, 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 we may not be charged for at the moment, or protecting services for vulnerable people. So they were fairly uh, interesting uh, um, elements of the consultation. Uh, about six in ten supported a council tax increase uh, in uh, one set of circumstances or another. Uh, and paragraph 10 was a supplementary question there, which drew some very wide-ranging responses. Uh, and some of them are, are not within the in the council's remit. So, for example, to merge um, district and county council together is not within our remit. But I think it's important to have all those answers or all those responses reported to, to members anyway, because uh, yeah, we are not uh, we are being transparent, and uh, and it's just interesting I think to see uh, where respondents' line of thinking is going on certain issues. So I've, I've literally included everything that we did get back and tried to make it in the, into a, as potted a summary as I possibly can, uh, possibly could. Um, so that's it, Chair. I'm happy to take any questions uh, uh, on the report. Right. Thank you, Tony. Um, any member would like to make an observation or a question of Tony, please? Councillor Sue Crozier. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, was, I was interested in the budget consultation and I just wondered if, if this year we changed it somewhat, because in past years, the main thing, the main result has been that our residents actually accept a council tax increase if, only if, if they know where it's going to be spent and they can see the result of it. But that question doesn't seem to be there this year. But, but as Tony has said, it's, it's really quite remarkable that 52% felt they were really fairly well informed about the financial challenges. So, so that was good that, that our residents are beginning to understand the challenges that we face. And I'd like to thank Tony for all his work and for the team's work. Thank you. Um, Catherine? Yeah, Cal Councillor Field. Yes, thank you. I wanted to comment about the environmental services and the amazing job the team does. Um, and the small amount of the budget. And it's very interesting, I think, in the public consultation to see that food safety only and licensing um, don't score very highly when those are the two services that really do keep our residents safe. Um, we need safe venues, we need safe taxes, and we have them, um, and we need safe food outlets, and yet people don't really seem to understand um, what exactly we do to keep them safe. And I wondered if there was a role for the comms in this, because people need to understand that. I think it's a very valid point. I think that um, it's something there that it's almost like the, um, um, uh, the, the protectors of, 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 of the residents that are out there, and they just get on with their job and they do it, and people don't really notice it. So it may be something that we can uh, raise at some point in our, in our communications in some way. Thank you. Um, any other Uh, Christine. Yes, uh, thank you. And I did just, um, before we started, give notice um, to, to um, our town you that I would, uh, I would uh, want to ask this, and I think Chris Watchman, who's um, online, might be able to help. At the, at, uh, the council meeting 
um, last week, we um, agreed changes to the um, the council tax reduction scheme, um, and I, I've, obviously those are incorporated into these revised figures. Um, when when does that become um, payable? So when can um, residents? I've already had an inquiry about um, somebody who's um, got a son who's self-employed who who could qualify for the um, for the discount. Can you just just um, let people know when that's um, when that's payable for? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, Chris Watson will hopefully, when he when he gets his turn, will confirm. But I believe it's from the first of April. The scheme initially was uh, designed to start from the first of April. But I bow to uh, bow to Chris um, uh, for him to confirm that. Thank you very much. Uh, any other comments from members? Um, perhaps I can invite. Um, Councillor Osborne, um, thank you for the chair work you did on the uh, 24th of January, perhaps it was, um, in, in uh, rigorously looking at the report and um, making the observations. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, you'll see on page 12 sort of basically what we come up with. I'm afraid we haven't found thousands of pounds anywhere, but uh, um, I think one. I think the, the, at the top of the page there, it's, it's worth noting. Um, Tony's made a point there, it would be essential to deliver the savings identified as part of the financial stability program or risk increased use of reserves. So that's something that we need to be uh, aware of. Um, and then it would be remiss of me not to mention Councillor Barnes and his pop-up housing or his 3D printed housing or, or whatever he's he was he, he sort of contacted me after the meeting and he sort of said, I don't think the minutes quite quite cover what he was trying to say in that we should be investing in modular homes. Um, but then, to be fair, uh, Joe Powell at the meeting did say that we had a number of completions coming soon on additional properties we're buying for um, homeless people to reduce the cost of the temporary accommodation. So I think sort of a swing and a roundabout there. I can see where Councillor Barnes is coming from, but on the other hand, I think Joe and his team have probably uh, have been have got it covered in that there's more properties being purchased. There was one thing I did notice on the on the one of the emails we get um, micro homes from a firm called uh, Solo House Solo House. Um, Cornwall Council have bought these things, and they've also been with Cambridge City Council, Ipswich, and and Haringey. So. They are out there like a single unit that, that someone can live in. But equally, if we're buying proper buildings, if you like, then, then that's probably better, to be honest. Um, and you've got an uh, asset that goes up in value as opposed to going down. Um, but there's nothing much else I can add, Chair. Okay. Well, thank you, Paul, for those uh, comments. I think you're absolutely right. If you're buying uh, bricks and mortar, it's always been a good investment historically. I think we can all identify that does have a, a sell-on value if ever it came to that situation. And I suppose the modular buildings, which I think um, I think the point has been made, and I know that um, officers are fully aware of this and given the opportunity, we'll incorporate that in an empty, uh, any development that we may have going forward. Uh, perhaps I can invite um, Councillor Dixon. Um, Jonathan, I'm offering you an opportunity of saying anything on this report. Uh, thank, thank you very much. much. I, I don't have any, any further comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Thank you, Chairman. And um, I'd like to propose the report as printed. It's not um, clearly where we want to be. We, we, we clearly don't want to be using reserves at the moment, but for the, the many reasons that we've spoken about many times, this is where we are. And it's vitally important that our financial stability program and our income generation is accelerated from this point forward. I think it's interesting to, to look back on what, why we're at this position and how we've got here. Obviously, COVID hasn't helped, but we can't use that as an excuse. Um, looking back on figures that, that have been provided, we can see that the, the decision not to raise council tax through the 2010s for, I think it was four years, has really impacted very, very heavily on the council's ability to raise its income through council tax. And as a... As a, as a, a a good figure of £883,000 that we would be raising now more 
than, than we are at the moment had we been increasing our council tax and therefore our base council tax by the amount allowed by the government through those years. And that is what we're paying for now. The simple, the simple uh, equation is that we do not have enough money coming in to pay what's going out. And that is the problem that we have faced ever since we've taken administration and that we've got to solve in the next 18 months or so. So I've got every faith in the team that they will, will, will manage this. I've got every faith that we've got things in the pipeline that are going to actually solve this, this problem. And we're going to um, finish this term of administration in a far better position than when we took it over. So I commend this report, Chairman. Second. Sorry about that. Um, those in favour? And that's unanimous. Um, I think we've also got to accept the fact that in 2019 our waste contract was a fair old hike, which I don't think we've fully appreciated, and it seemed to be a, a spiralling upward cost to uh, this administration or to the council, um, which uh, will, will take its toll as we go forward, um, because they are seriously big numbers. Um, right, if we can move into the um, next item, which I think is item seven, the draft <clears throat> capital strategy and updated capital program for approval. Um, Tony Baden, Chief Finance Officer. Thank you, Chair. It's me, so, me again. Um, so, yes, the members are asked to, to recommend this report to Council, recommend the strategy, that the capital strategy for the organisation and the updated program. So um, that, that's pretty much the, the headline, the strap line, really. Uh, just to give members a little bit of background, it's quite a lengthy report, I'm afraid, but it's uh, it, the report and the sort of content of the report are, are required by SIPA's um, codes of practice with regards to uh, provincial borrowing and treasury management. And you know, the, as, a, as a responsible authority, those are codes that we, we adhere to. So apologies for the length of the report, and I'll try and draw out the interesting bits for members or the more interesting bits for members as we go along. Uh, so, as I say, the capital programme is largely an update on expected cash flows. There are no new schemes within that programme as such. Uh, the process by which we can change that during the year, I think, is outlined in the, in the report uh, somewhere. But, as I say, nothing would go uh, to members without prior approval. Or would, nothing would be included in the programme, rather, without prior approval of members. So, uh, if I could just pick on the, the, the capital strategy itself... Uh, it gives a high-level view of how we manage and finance our capital programme, basically. Uh, and, and the main elements of the strategy are set out in Appendix A. And I'll draw out some of the, the, the highlights of that. So, so uh, how rather will finance this capital expenditure? We've explained that in paragraphs 2 to 8. Uh, no surprises. It's mainly from borrowing, grants, or capital receipts, and, and a little bit from revenue reserves. Uh, and Table 2 on page 17 will hopefully... Uh, illustrate that a little bit more clearly to members. Uh, paragraphs 26 to 28 uh, outlines the impact on the, on the revenue budget, and this mainly comes, or entirely comes, from uh, where we use borrowing to fund capital expenditure. So we're talking about debt repayment uh, and, ca uh, and loan interest as well. Uh, so sorry, just to go back now to Table 5 and Paragraph 13 on, on page 18. I uh, just want to say a little bit about this. Uh, that, this that outlines our capital finance and requirement, which is very close to what our actual borrowing is. Now, the capital finance requirement is what we need to finance capital expenditure from, from, from loan debt. Uh, now, what we've been able to do so far is uh, use our internal reserves. So we haven't had to go out and borrow. We've been able to use our internal reserves, uh, which has kept the, um, the interest cost down, as you, as you would imagine. Uh, but what we've all now done recently, and I I have reported this to members two or three times now in the recent past, is that we've taken out a lot of, uh, or we've taken out new longer-term borrowing um, at, a, at a very, very low interest rate. So we're still within our capital financing requirement limit. That keeps us within the uh, within the law, if you like, within the, uh, within the prudential code. Uh, but by taking advantage of these long-term rates, and I think we've already seen over the last week where the Bank of England have put up interest rates again, uh, it's going to get. It's going to save the council a lot of money over a 50-year period. Now, very, very roughly, and it depends on what rates you take out new borrowing in the future. But I estimate it could be something as high as 4.1 million over 50 years, uh, which equates to about 82,000 pounds a year. So, 82,000 pounds a year doesn't sound a lot um, in, in the grand scheme of things. But I think 4 million over 50 years 
it, it, it was it, it illustrates that it's worth, it was worth doing. Uh, so the, the council's expected borrowing limits, uh, I've set those out on pages 15 to 16. These are limits that you as members approve and they are uh, limits that, uh, as, as Chief Finance Officer, I must make sure that the council doesn't exceed those limits. Uh, we don't expect to, to exceed them. They're set, usually set much higher than what we'd, uh, or what we'd ordinarily think we need. But that's just to give us a little bit of flexibility, particularly whilst we're sorting out some sort of financing uh, structure issues around um, around sort of borrowing for uh, to Alliance Homes Rother, for example. Uh, and we're working those proposals up now as we speak with, um, with uh, our, link, our, our Treasury advisors, Link. Uh, and we're looking at, as I said before, to be poor, to try and drive down that, um, that cost of borrowing to the council as much as we can. Uh, and finally, paragraphs 29 to 30, uh, they're, they're not to show off what brilliant accountants we are. They are um, required by the code for us to put in there to let members know what level of uh, expertise and knowledge we've got in the organisation uh, and where we don't have uh, treasury management, as I'm sure members can, can appreciate, it's quite a complex area. So where we don't necessarily have the expertise in-house, we use our um, treasury advisors link uh, to, to help, us, uh, help us get over those sort of uh, knowledge gaps, if you like. Uh, and that, in total, in totality, helps us manage all elements of our capital strategy. Uh, so that, those are the main points, Chair. I'll try to keep it as brief and interesting as I can, and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. Um, Catherine, Councillor Field? Sorry, I was just twitching my Uh, obviously overcome by excitement. Shall I invite Jonathan, would you like to make any, any comments on this particular report? Uh, I don't have any comments at this moment, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, are the other members would like to make any um, comments? No? If I can leave it with um, Councillor Dixon to remove this report. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you everyone for getting this far through this report. It's um, one, of, one of the drier reports that are going. Not as bad as um, Treasury management, but almost on that level. Um, I think congratulations to the, to the team in, in pre-borrowing money. Clearly, we've seen the, the end of cheap money or the start of the end of cheap money uh, to be borrowed, and, uh, which is a, is a shame given what's hopefully coming up on the horizon for us uh, in the near future, but we will still get competitive rates in, uh, for, for a little while. Uh, I think the, the bottom of, of, the, uh, of the percentage points is gone now. Um, I've got no, nothing really else to add. It's, it's all there. There's, there's, there's nothing else more to say. I'd just uh, like to recommend the report. Thank you. And someone's going to second that report? Second. And those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Tony. I think it's important when we look at the... Um, Item 11, or it's paragraph 11, you know, is our commitment to invest in the district and improve, you know, the district by providing houses and jobs, uh, whereas I know other local authorities, as we all know, have gone out into a bit of a pawnbreaking type of uh, operation of borrowing money cheap and investing it in places like Grimsby, Hull, Slough, nothing wrong with those places, but I don't think you invest money which you can't feel to touch the assets that you're, um, you're looking to acquire. So uh, thank you for that, Tony, and your work put into that. Um, if we can move forward on to item eight, um, this is the report that Chris will, um, Chris Watchman who is hovering somewhere, and Chris will come in and uh, report to agree a COVID-19 additional relief fund scheme to provide non-domestic rate relief to businesses affected by the pandemic but not eligible for existing relief schemes. Evening, Chris, I hope you're not feeling too unwell. I'm fine, thank you. Uh, and thank you for coming along this evening. I'll leave the report for you to um, present, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, the COVID-19 Additional Relief Fund has been made available to offer support by way of a business rate reduction to businesses affected by the pandemic who are ineligible for existing support links to business rates. A total of 1.2 million has been allocated to Rother for the scheme, which is required to be applied to business rate accounts during the 2021-2022 tax year. It's for each local authority to design and implement a scheme. However, guidance from government does set out some expectations on how funding is expected to be used. The main one being that it, it must be directed towards ratepayers who have been adversely affected by the pandemic. Therefore, as it's likely that not all ratepayers have been affected, 
It's proposed that businesses operating the sectors listed in the report be excluded from the scheme. Work has taken place to identify the maximum level of reduction that could be awarded whilst remaining within the funding limits. Initial findings suggest that reduction could be in the region of 38%, and it's proposed that the same percentage reduction is given to all eligible businesses. The relief will be awarded automatically, although businesses will be expected to confirm by way of a declaration that they have been adversely affected by the pandemic and that they comply with the UK's subsidy control obligations. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm happy to take any, any questions that um, there may be. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, uh, anybody who would like to ask questions of Chris regarding the report? <laughs> Christine, did you? No, I, I don't have any questions, but... Yes, I would like to make some observations, sorry. Um, yeah, I, yet again, I think this is an excellent report from our officers in the uh, in the in the team that deal with um, support to businesses. Um, we, we, we've been particularly successful of, across Rother in supporting our businesses. The amount of businesses that I go into where they all say, "Oh, you, you know, I, I, you can't fault Rother for how it's um, got the support out to." out to um, small businesses and, and bigger businesses. And, and that is, um, that's a testament really to um, the work of, um, of Chris and his, uh, and his team. Um, I think it's, this is a, a, an interesting additional grant that we've just, that as I say, has just come out. Um, because we were so successful earlier on in the year, we did actually have another sort of tranche of money and I think we were one of only 30 councils in the in the entire country that got additional um, money which we then packaged up into making the difference grants um, we had a very very successful um, uh, grants uh, meeting chaired by uh, councillor Prochak um, a couple of weeks back and um, that um, grant is virtually now and um, we're just I think uh, finishing off um, you know, tidying that up, but it's that is virtually spent. Although the business interruption grants are still available, and I would stress to any businesses that are watching this evening that if you have to close uh, because because of COVID, either all your staff or 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 you um, uh, you're pinged. Uh, as long as you've got the NHS um, app um, evidence, um, there is grant. Um, money available from from this particular pot, and and it is something that Rother um, has done un uniquely, um, you know, not not re replication elsewhere. So this new grant scheme will come on stream very shortly, and making a difference grants uh, will be paid out very very shortly. Um, and um, you know there are still other ways that businesses can be supported. And through COVID and, and as we recover. So I'd like to congratulate them and I'd like to just uh, remind businesses um, out there that there is still support available if you need it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Uh, Jonathan, would you like to make any comments on this report? Right, I think I'll take uh, no, that. Thank you very much, Chris. Can I just ask a question? You did give give this figure. Um, how much in total have we received and distributed since the start of the pandemic? It's a figure you came up with, but it just doesn't. I just can't seem to find it at the moment in my mind. Um, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you, but um, it is it is tens of millions. Um, yeah, I think the last, it was it was close to thirty million. I think the last time time I looked, but I can confirm that out now. That's that right. for you. Uh, it was that figure of thirty million, which I think is a, a hell of a chunk of money to have gone out there in, uh, under the demands that you and your team have had. Um, so thank you for that. Have I got someone who's going to um, propose this? I will move it. I'm going to second this report. Very happy to second. Thank you. And those in favour? Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I, I do beg your pardon, Councillor <laughs> Osborne. Just at the time was um, going so quickly. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chairman. I think I think it's worth worth sort of noting if any business people are, are watching this and they're saying, "Well, how do I get this?" Item twelve 
basically he said, uh, eligible businesses will re re receive the relief automatically. So those eligible will have a nice bit of email, post, turn up in the bank account, whatever. So, so they don't even have to do anything to get it if you're eligible. And I think that's been you know, the simplicity of some of these schemes, which I think initially they were very sort of cumbersome, but I think they've been able to be streamlined and I think officers have actually dealt with it in a very uh, efficient way. I just wanted to add to that because Councillor Bayliss has mentioned the fact that we had the panel, which really worked, I think, really worked very well, um, that we did query uh, about fraud, particularly given the gov government's um, problems with the huge amount of fraud that they've suffered from. I mean, a thousand businesses were given grants when they weren't even operating as businesses. So we have got checks and balances in place, um, particularly when people are taking on leases. And I just wanted to reassure members that, that that is the case, and we will do checks and checks on it. I think it's always reassuring that there are controls and, check, uh, and checks over a situation where such a significant amount of money is uh, slushing around, and people will want to try and access that um, by all sorts of means. Um, so forgive me, uh, Paul, for not um, picking up your question earlier, your statement earlier. Um, I think we had got a proposal on a second, and have we voted? I can't remember. Yes, we have. Unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. Um, item nine. Oh, sorry. Yes, by all means. Oh, he's gone. He didn't even ask me to go. He's gone. <laughs> Enjoy your evening, especially if you're not feeling very well. Um, item nine. Electric, electric vehicle charging in car parks owned by Rother. Um, report of Deborah. And I believe the chair of the... Um, Task Force is, may want to make some comments um, during this particular um, point. Uh, Deborah. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, yes, this report is to seek approval to procure an appropriate provider to install electric vehicle charging infrastructure in selected Rother District Council car parks. Um, <clears throat> and as referred to in paragraph 10 and 16 of the report, um, officers were asked to research a method of installing um, a public, publicly available EV charging point provision in suitable council-owned car parks across the district at nil capital cost to the council in order to provide an initial service to a high proportion of residents and visitors. Um, it's been suggested that the EV charging points may be placed in a high user car parks in Rye, Battle and Bex Hill. So the report goes on to talk about um, officer meetings with um, four EV charging um, point providers um, who each purported to supply and install electric vehicle infrastructure at nil capital cost to the council. Um, <clears throat> officers also spoken to other local authorities who have been through this similar process or at the procurement stage to, to gain insight and learn from their experience. So a little bit more detail about the providers. Um, some providers are tied to providing one type of charging point. Others may be unrestricted and, and can select the most suitable. It all depends on the individual business models. Once appointed, all providers, or the ones I spoke to, stated they will complete an initial feasibility study at no cost to the council to ascertain appropriate sites and prime locations that have good grid connection, 24-7 access to users, and good facilities nearby. The results of these studies will largely dictate where the providers would wish to place the charging points and the type of charger. Um, for instance, a fast or a rapid charger, most of the chargers that would be put into our car parks um, would probably be fast chargers, um, where mainly due to people being there parked for perhaps some hours to charge their vehicles. Um, as mentioned in paragraph 17 of the report, the appointed provider will cover all the costs of the feasibility studies, equipment and infrastructure. They will own the charging units and they will be liable for the operation, maintenance and upgrading of the equipment. Some providers, um, again depending on their business model, um, may wish to lease the appointing charging base from the council. 
most would require a contract with the council over a term of perhaps 15 to 20 years. Um, and depending on the provider, the council may receive a proportion of the revenue generated after perhaps three to five years, once the provider has recouped initial investment costs. The provider may obtain funding through a variety of um, third party sources, including government backed schemes, which will need to be submitted by the council working alongside the provider. Different providers offer consumers um, different ways of um, paying for the, the service that they're getting, such as mobile phone apps, um, setting up personal accounts, contactless payments and prices will vary according to a number um, of criteria, as mentioned in point paragraph 23 of the, of the report. The providers all state that the project will take time to complete, largely due to power network provision, and that we should allow 12 months or perhaps longer to complete the installation. So the key points to note from this report um, is that recent learnings from other LAs show that forward preparation and due diligence completed on relevant council-owned car parks prior to procuring a provider will support a more accurate and responsive tender process um, to achieve the best results. Because of this hidden background work, it may appear that little is being done by the council, but it is important preparation and should support a better outcome at the end. If the council wishes to provide charging points at nil cost to the council, it is important to ensure that the specification is attractive enough to providers to generate interest, who will wish to come on board and invest for the longer term in order to recoup their costs and generate a return on their investment. Once appointed, the provider will need to work with our electric distribution network operator, which in our case is UK Power Networks, to complete a feasibility study to determine into which car parks it is economically feasible and practical to install electric vehicle charging points. Again, it may appear that nothing is happening but this is necessary work that may take some months. Once these processes are completed, it can then be established the best car parks for EV charging points and the installation of the underground infrastructure can commence. The last part is the actual install of the above ground infrastructure. So it's a bit like house building in many ways. A lot of the initial um, project time is spent in the pre-planning pre and is invisible. It's important for councillors to note the items referred to in paragraph 34 of the risk management of this report. This sets out some of the advantages and disadvantages of the proposal to provide residents and visitors with EV charging points at nil cost to the council. So in summary, the main overriding advantage of this proposal is that all costs and risks are transferred to the provider. However, this means that the council will have a limited control on where the charging points are installed and the cost of the charge to the consumer. And the revenue generated from the charges will largely go to the provider. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, uh, Deborah. And it is quite a um, complicated uh, procedure, it would appear, and a lot of work's gone into this, although we actually haven't got them out there yet. But I'm sure there may be some questions or comments to be made this evening. Dixon. Just a comment really, Chairman. I think it's quite disappointing that a small district council like ourselves have to go through all these hoops and, and difficulties to get this done, where this is really a national thing. Charging your car has got to be a national problem with national solutions and with some guidance from, from, um, from government to, to tell us how to do it. And that seems to be, uh, to me, that it's a hodgepodge of local solutions across the country that's going to provide this, and it's not going to be um, suitable for what we're going to need going forward. But uh, I commend Deborah and the work she's done. We're doing the best of what we can out of what we've got. I suspect there's going to be a lot more hurdles to overcome, particularly finding enough power to do this in some of our rural locations. But um, it's, this is something that the, the public want, the public need, and the public expect us to do. So it's very important that we do the best that we possibly can on this and, and hopefully have something tangible within 12 months. Thank you. 
asking for those comments. I think they were uh, readily um, acknowledged. The fact that a lot of work has gone in by Deborah and her team, and it's been over a difficult period of time from a resourcing point of view and getting to where we are at the moment. Uh, Jonathan, did you want to make any comment? Uh, I, I concur with what uh, Councillor Dixon has just said. I think uh, he set it out very adequately. And did I see Councillor Cortell? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in Hastings, there are already 17 charging points in their car parks. Um, they've got charging points in several car parks. Now, I realise that some have multiple charging points, but um, it's uh, concerning that there's only a target of one car park in Bex Hill with a charging point. And I note that the steering group uh, on climate change uh, in their minutes state members were keen to see the project commenced as soon as possible, which I totally agree with, with the maximum number of charging points installed. Um, so I'm only asking whether uh, there might be the possibility of uh, negotiating with the provider to install charging points in more than one car park in Bexhill. Okay, perhaps I can decide if I ever to respond to that. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> what we will do first is that background work um, by our team, the Rother District Council team, to um, look at all the car parks that we have, keep an open mind, and see what the, um, the sort of high-level infrastructure is available um, before we go out to procurement. So we've got a good idea of covenants, restrictions on the use of car parks and things like that. Once we have that information, um, I think it would be a good idea to make this as attractive as possible to providers. So we will give them the full list of those potential car parks. So it might be more than one in Bexhill. Um, but it, as I say, the important part is at the end of the day, it will be decided really by the UK Power Network provision, how they can link up to which car parks and which ones are economically feasible for the provider to install in. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Deborah. Um, Councillor Dixon. Thank you, Chairman. I mean, while, while that would be very nice, unfortunately, this council doesn't have any money to invest in this project, and it's not going to be a, an income-generating project for the council, so we have to rely on what other people can do for us. And, and also, I'd like to point out that, that actually they're car parks. They are there to park cars. They're not charging stations, and this will be an extra service, an extra facility to use for people with electric cars parking in our, our car parks. What we can't do as a council is provide charging points for the residents of, of Bexhill or, or the rural areas. That has to be done, a bit, like I said earlier, on a national scale, probably by the county council with on-street um, charging. This is a project that's going to be an addition to people parking cars. And indeed, places like Battle and Rye are probably going to be more attractive because they're destinations uh, where people are going to come for the day and wish to, wish to charge their cars while they're, they're visiting. So I suspect that Councillor Cortell won't get what he, what he wants, and I would suggest that maybe East Sussex County Council is the best place to, to start uh, uh, lobbying because they have the responsibility of on-street, and uh, they're the ones who need to be looking at putting a charge in, in, in lampposts and such like to actually allow people who live in the town to be able to charge cars easily. Yeah, I totally agree with you, and I think most members would agree to that, is that the lead needs to be taken nationally and then perhaps via our um, local authorities in order to really get this moving if they're really serious about what the uh, intentions are. Um, oh, there's a hand up. Catherine. Indication not at which I would like, I would like to speak on this. Um, and I do share everybody's frustration. It has taken a long time to get going with this, but we are at last making progress. Um, and just everything, um, preparation is the key. Um, you've got to get that right, otherwise the whole thing will fall. Complicated has been the word of the debate, um, and it will continue to be so. Um, I, I think you, know, you think you'll have a point there, and we'll just get someone to put it up, but it is a lot more complicated than that. People have been talking to me about phases of electricity. I haven't a clue what that means, but apparently it's important. But then we have a wonderful team of Deborah who will sort all those things out for us, and the infrastructure has got to be right underneath. I think the important thing is no capital cost to the council. And indeed, 
the companies which will do it in the end will take all the risk, which means that when technology changes, and I'm sure it will, um, it could be their risk and not ours, which I think is a really important point for the Council's budget going forward. I think it's also important to note that the points that we will be installing are just part of a network of points which will be available throughout the district. Um, there will be, hopefully, some on-street ones, and I, um, as a county councillor, I've got a written question in it to the county council tomorrow to ask about on-street car parking and using lampposts. Um, there will be the points that are the charging points that come with planning applications. There will be other people do that, and people will have them in their own homes. And I would suspect, I've got no evidence for this, that the more we have around the place, the more points which come with planning applications, the fewer we will actually need in our car park. It's part of a network. It's never planned to be the total solution. And just to remind members, when cars are parked in car parks, charging their cars, they're still required to pay the parking fee. Um, and with that, I would say um, I'd like to move the report. Uh, thank you. Um, the that's when that's on to second the report. I second. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. Um, those in favour? That's unanimous. Um, thank you very much indeed, Deb, for all the work you've put in on this. I think everybody just assumed it was an overnight sort of fix that you go out and someone comes in and plonk these things in car parks and away we go. But it is very, very complex, and I know you've put an awful lot of work into this, and uh, that's very much appreciated. Um, are you going to remain for the rest of the meeting? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, right, if we just move on to the next item, which is the key performance. <coughs> targets um, report from director Ben Hook place and climate change and this had this gone to scrutiny I believe so this has come to us from scrutiny and uh, I think that I've read through it all and it all seems pretty straightforward but um, that's not for me to decide uh, Ben if you want to make any comments or observations and members thank you thank you chair yes so um, the, uh, the this is uh, obviously as you said this has come from scrutiny the um, uh, the report uh, contains five key areas for consideration by a cabinet. The first area is the uh, is number one, housing communities. There have been a few changes from last year that have been recommended by, by overview and scrutiny. Financial performance, again, a couple of changes there. Uh, economic development and poverty uh, is, is, is exactly the same as it was uh, the previous year. Um, environment uh, is to include the carbon baseline, which we yet to have a target confirmed. Obviously, we need to establish the baseline prior to um, uh, prior to, uh, to to sort of setting a target against that, and then planning. Obviously, is a key key area for for monitoring. Um, this this uh, basket of KPIs would be monitored quarterly by overview and scrutiny, with any further recommendations for actions to be taken against those to be then brought to cabinet. Um, uh, following those. So uh, I'm happy to take any questions on those and uh, obviously Councillor Osborne as Chair of Overview and Scrutiny um, uh, on the recommendations as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, if there's any members who might like um, Chair of Scrutiny, Paul, would you like to um, make some observations on what the uh, outcome was of the uh, meeting? In this particular time? Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think Ben's covered it, really. We, we just thought we would make sure that we, we should cover sort of the environmental aspect um, and get a, get, a, get a sort of a, get a feel on how that's going and keep an eye on it. it was, um, Councillor Gray was very keen on that one. Um, we thought, well, you know, if, if we've made that a sort of a priority for the council to to sort of keep an eye on climate change, then we should have an indicator and let us know where we're going with it. So um, that's what we thought we would do. Uh, waste collection obviously is is uh, is part and parcel of that. And one of the ideas, you know, we're we're recycling sort of fifty percent of of our waste, and we said, well, should we set a higher target so you've got something to work to? But then there was a counter argument from I think it was from Councillor Field who said you should probably set a lower target so you have less waste to recycle. In other words, so it's. It's a, it's a funny thing. It's, you know, should you say, oh, we can recycle 100% of their waste? Or should you say, well, if you produce less waste in the first place, you wouldn't have to reduce, you wouldn't have to re recycle so much anyway. If that makes sense. <laughs> but, um, but, but yeah, and no, I'm happy with the report as, as it is. So, thank you. Catherine? Yes, thank you. It was me that put that particular spanner in the work. Um, I, I, was, 
think the target is probably driven by government, but it always seems to me that if you have a target for recycling, you are going to be producing rubbish to recycle, whereas recycling is third in the waste hierarchy behind reducing and reusing. But actually, and I don't know how you do target it, but you shouldn't be targeting for lots of recycling. You should be targeting for how much of your rubbish you recycle, but not the actual quantity of it, because you should be reducing it or not using it in the first place. Uh, Sue, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, just to add to what your your comments are on the recycling, that um, it's actually recycling is not a district council function. The recycling is actually county council. We do not have any budget, and I regret this. We do not have any budget for education, and members across the council will know how tricky it is for people to know what to put in their recycling. Um, and also on the horizon, I hope on the horizon, we've got the Environment Bill, which will actually change whether we have a target for recycling or not, because the bill actually uh, um, empowers um, individuals for taking back glass and for companies for reducing their packaging. So it will be a totally new game we're in there. And whether we can even set a target will be questionable. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sue. Um... Councillor Byrne. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to make a comment on the, um, the housing and communities KPIs and, and a more general comment on KPIs. And I think our Director of Place and Climate um, cut to the chase, really, when he said the, the whole point of having performance indicators. So when we've measured our performance against those indicators, we can take action. So it, it's, it's necessary that the, the quantities we monitor are those which will generate some action. Now, in housing, it's very, very difficult. This housing is largely demand-led. But I think we've gone as far, I think, over the scrutiny and um, the housing team have gone as far as they can in proposing um, indicators that, that do enable us to look at our performance, look at how we are keeping up with what is an ever-moving picture. In fact, during COVID, it's an even even more ever-moving picture. So I'm very happy with what they've suggested. Uh, and But don't be, don't be lulled into a sense of um, security to say these are the only things we monitor. Um, housing and housing needs and our response to it are monitored in all sorts of ways. But these are probably the most, the good ones to choose for a headline for, uh, for examination by overview and scrutiny in, in future, future meetings. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the comments, Terry. Um, anybody else? Kevin, would you like to just move this report? Quite happy to move this report, Chairman. Come to second that, Terry. Thank you. Uh, those in favour? Unanimous. Thank you very much. But I do think that this is a part of where scrutiny is actually functioning, and I think that's important, Paul, and that's down to you as Chair, and actually making sure that we're getting as much uh, response from members. I think it, it brings it out, and that we know that we've got this... Um, area that we can uh, be monitored and thanks very much for the uh, work that was put in at the last meeting. Now I think we are now at a point of moving into confidential session so um, we I will allow 20 minutes 20, 20 minutes 20 seconds for the equipment to cease to operate. Uh, do we need to move? Okay, so this is the report of development of Beaching Road, Excel. And we're now going into confidential session. Before you close the meeting, can I just congratulate the officers and, and uh, Councillor Reinhold for joining? Um, it, it's worked. We were going to have training on it, and we decided we'd just sort of suck it and see, as it were. And congratulations to the technicians there. Thank you. Yep, I would just endorse that. Thank you very much indeed for uh, giving up your evening this evening and making this um, operate really smoothly. Um, Jonathan, are you going to go back to bed? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so I think we're actually at, uh, officially closed the meeting. Uh, thank you for those attending. At uh, what time was it now? 7.46. Um, that's the end of tonight's cabinet meeting. Thank you very much, everybody.